It looks like biochar. It looks like biochar. But smells like redwood. You get a fair bit of steam off the product, eh? Now, why does soil get hot? Just the microbes going to work, basically. Yeah, uh, I mean, think about you breathing in your mask. Yeah. It gets warm. Yeah. And in here, there's no way for it to get out. You know what I mean? Like, it's got to go yeah. through 15 feet or more. The heat and the energy that the microbes all, are creating. Because yeah, there's billions of them, yeah. right? And they're all working. Now, we can actually, heat. has it been known to actually catch on fire? Uh, we have not caught it on fire. Um, but it does happen. Obviously, this is the secret sauce of one of the byproducts that you guys use. Absolutely. And we have Nate, who is a soil expert on staff. Yeah, he's uh, our certified soil scientist. He's also a lecturer at Humboldt State University. Um, you know, just an all around great guy, very knowledgeable and, you know, what we consider an expert in the soil world. Beautiful. Thanks for uh, joining us. Yeah, no problem. What got you to becoming a soil scientist. I mean, it seems like a very, um, very narrow field of work. It, it is a bit. And it's one of those things that it wasn't like, hey, I want to be a soil scientist. Yeah. Because I don't think anybody ever says that. <laughs> um, possibly because nobody knows that's an option, right? Yeah. Like I know I didn't in high school and all the science classes that I took was kind of just, we did geology, we did chemistry, we did physics, but mm -hmm. soils was not really talked about. Mm -hmm. Um, so for me, it was my last semester <clears throat> and I needed to take soils and had been kind of avoiding it and sat in the first day and everything just clicked. All of the chemistry and botany and biology, like all those things, like soil gave them a home to see how they all fit together. Mm -hmm. Like you start being able to see like, okay, well, these rocks are over here. Okay. And these rocks make that soil. The soil is letting these types of plants grow on it. Now the plants are in turn influencing the soil by the organic matter that they accumulate. What are we looking at here? So we are looking at uh, our forest product or our aged forest humus, whatever you want to call it. This is essentially semi-composted redwood. Mm -hmm. So comes from our local mills um, as a byproduct of just the, the timber industry. Mm -hmm. um, so diverting it as far as like waste stream. And it goes through a, a fairly intensive process um, where we take that raw sawdust and get to something that you see see in your potting mixes. Um, so it starts out just as, as just the, the raw redwood sawdust, um, gets inoculated um, with some nitrogen mm -hmm. and it goes through a, a process where it gets rolled every week um, until Temperatures start to drop, carbon nitrogen ratios start to, to balance and, and mellow themselves out. And you get something that is really functional in terms of holding on to nutrients, but also providing good amounts of, of drainage and some water holding ability. It's the backbone of everything. Well, and it is. And any anyone who's grown anything knows that, right? And, and that's one of the hard things about soils. You've got so much variation from place to place to place that science kind of largely ignored it because it was it was difficult to deal with. So what are the three uh, most important things, me as a gardener, growing my own food at home, what can I do to help make better soil? Sure. Um, so in terms of, of making better soil and, and getting better yields, one of the best and easiest things you can do is add quality organic matter. I say quality organic matter because not all organic matter is the same, right? Different carbon nitrogen ratios, different other elements in there. You, know, you want something that's you know, clean and you want something that, you know, is going to match the time frame that you have. So it's OK to put, you know, woodier things or uh, other things that have higher carbon nitrogen ratios in the soil. If you can let it sit there for a while mm -hmm. and break down, it might be useful next year. Exactly. So, you know, you can do like your fall prep. Mm -hmm. You add a bunch of organic matter to soil, it mellows out, breaks down over the winter. Yep. Now you're ready to plant it in the spring. That's not something you'd want to do in the spring, though. You want something that's going to break down quick and re-release those nutrients so they're mm -hmm. not getting tied up. Yep. 
it, with organic matter, it really comes down to carbon, nitrogen, and your microbes, mm -hmm. right? So microbes win every time. Your plant cannot outcompete mm -hmm. the sheer volume of microbes that are in the soil. Yeah, and that's the beauty of making a tea. Right, yeah, so you can add that biology back in, um, but whatever organic matter source you're adding, like I said, if it's quality, it's broken down some, it's gonna provide tons of organisms to the soil too. So if you're a little deficient in certain mm -hmm. organisms or you're trying to rehabilitate that soil, that's the easiest way to do it. I mean, you can make teas, you can do all sorts of stuff, but just adding quality organic matter is the, the easiest and the biggest bang for your buck. Too. Having the coconut fiber, I find, really creates a more lofty, uh, more lignin-based. Having the forest humus, these things really keep for a loftier product, which really helps with, especially when you're finishing a crop, your carbon, nitrogen, your carbon to oxygen ratio. Um, it just really doesn't compress, which I really like. Yeah, and part of that's just the, the shape of things, right? Like, mm -hmm. peat is coming from all sorts of different plants, and it's broken down into all sorts of different particle sizes, right? Everything from that super fine dusty stuff to the coarser fiber stuff. But cocoa fiber doesn't really end up like that. It has a pretty consistent, you know, hair size and hair length, especially as we, we process it. So you're not like one sponge against another sponge mm -hmm. trapping more water and it traps more air in the medium, lets water flow through more effectively. Mm -hmm. And so you can get that kind of drain through it holds enough water then to support your plant, but also enough oxygen so that it's going to cycle nutrients quickly and effectively. As a home grower, I've got a bunch of soil. Uh, I asked you the, the question of what three things can I do to better my soil? Yeah. So uh, get your soil tested. Okay. Know what's in it as far as nutrients, know what the pH is, and take care of those accordingly. Uh, pH is hugely influential on how effective your fertilizer program is. If you're outside of the you know, uptake range for whatever plant that you're growing mm -hmm. is, those nutrients aren't gonna be available. The quickest way to waste money is to have a pH that's too high or too low and keep applying those nutrients. It doesn't matter how many you apply, mm -hmm. they're not gonna be available if that pH doesn't match. So if you've got a low pH or high pH, you know, do the things that you need to correct it. Mm -hmm because that means you're gonna be able to apply less fertilizer and have that fertilizer be more effective, mm -hmm. right? So saving you money environmentally, that's hugely beneficial yeah. just for the shipping of all those materials, but then also any of the excess that might leach out that your plant's not getting to. Mm -hmm. So yeah, get your soil tested. It's relatively cheap and easy. You know, if you're outside in a garden, usually every other year is pretty sufficient. It's not something you have to do all the time, but that little step will will make a big difference in the long run, especially yeah. if you're trying to build your soil and you know, really get it to be as good as it can be. Switching up your crops, mm -hmm. not planting the same thing in the same spot over and over. Um, anything that lives in the soil tends to multiply when you grow the same thing over and over, which mm -hmm. means that not only do some of the, the beneficial organisms do that, but also some of the, the pathogens are gonna do it too. So your fungal diseases, bacterial diseases, you keep adding that same type of organic matter and those things are gonna start being more and more present because you're you're providing their food source, what they, mm -hmm. what they need, right? So that's really useful, just being able to suppress disease and, and other types of pests. Um, but also for nutrient cycling, it's really important too. Mm -hmm. um, if you're growing a, a mixed veggie garden, you've got plants that have different root depths, mm -hmm. which means that they're pulling up different nutrients. They're also gonna leave different kinds of organic matter, mm -hmm. more or less cellulose, more or less other, you know, components that are gonna create more diversity in your microbial population. Mm -hmm. And and to go back to that, you know, feeding your plant, this is another way besides organic matter that you can feed your soil, right? You're, you're giving it a diverse diet and those mm -hmm. things are naturally gonna create more healthy balanced populations than if you're just growing, you know, the same couple things over and over. Beautiful. We've heard, we've seen a real movement towards no-till or regenerative gardening, mm -hmm. and I, I I really embrace this um, this type of gardening because it's 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 growers trying to align themselves more with nature and the way things have always been done. Uh, what's your take on those? Yeah. So I no-till is great um, 
for, for all sorts of reasons, specifically erosion. Uh, that's really kind of one of the biggest things in, in any type of farming, whether it's small scale or big scale. Is, what is erosion? Well, so you don't have plant cover, you don't have some sort of cover, even mm -hmm. I mean, it could be mulch of any kind or, or you know, just actual like vegetative cover. If you don't have something on the surface to hold that soil down, it blows away mm -hmm. uh, or washes away one or some combination of the two. And once it's gone, there's no real <laughs> like way to get it back. back. Um, you know, the wind's taking it and putting it somewhere else. Yeah. I mean, you can see dust storms that come off Western Africa and hit the East Coast. Mm -hmm. So it's not like it's moving a short distance. Yeah. You also build up the organic matter. Uh, the enemy to organic matter is oxygen, right? Or same thing when you take uh, the water out of a, a peat bog. Mm -hmm. That peat's going to start breaking down because you're not in anaerobic condition. I'm not saying that you want anaerobic conditions in your soil, but the more you till the soil, the more oxygen you add. The more oxygen you add, the more organic matter breaks down. And that's been one of the the big issues with you know conventional farming practices is that you big carbon release when that happens. Something like about a third of all the carbon that's in the atmosphere since the industrial revolution is coming directly from agriculture. Not mm -hmm. all not all tillage. I mean, some of it's a fossil fuel use and sure. and some other things, but a, th a third of it's coming from ag. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is is directly due to that tillage. So it, it, it just, it, it gives you a perspective of how important uh, a gardener's action is, how important uh, we need to look at regenerative gardening as something that's sustainable. But the key is first and foremost, like I said, find out what your pH is of your medium, and then work within those parameters. Yeah. yeah, and I say, like we've already said, get the soil tested, but if you don't really understand and there's some things going on, call a certified soil scientist or a certified crop advisor. Take the time, take the money, and dedicate that to gaining some knowledge for yourself, because you're gonna walk away more informed than when you walked in, and you don't have to do these things every single time or every single year mm -hmm. as you gain the knowledge and understanding. And that's really what we're trying to wage is an education campaign. So we all learn more and mm -hmm. we can all do better at capturing carbon, capturing water and growing in a more sustainable way without wasting nutrients, nutrifying our water sources, creating algae and things like that. So mm -hmm. seek the knowledge. And if you don't want to do it for just the pursuit of knowledge, do it because it makes economic sense. Totally. I mean, th these are all good economic principles. You're not just flushing fertilizer down the drain. Right? I think it just comes down to people should be asking the question why or how more often. And when you do that, you naturally become a better steward toward the plant.